everybody, welcome to my talk, EmberJS, DevOps, and you. Um, this talk will really be centered around um, about DevOps and what I learned about building a plugin for Ember CLI Deploy. So you're probably wondering who the heck is this guy and why is he talking about DevOps, that we're talking about NPM, but my name is Ihan Yagachuku. I'm a software engineer at DigitalOcean in New York City, and you can see that's my Twitter handle right there. So question of the day, what is DevOps? Like, aren't there specialized people for that? Why should I even really care about that? Whenever I really see the word DevOps, I kind of have this reaction, like, because, you know, right. <laughs> um, so yeah, DevOps. What DevOps is, is actually a clip compound of the words development and operations. So looking at these two words, what you can do is break down the definition into, well, defining it as DevOps being the encompassing of the processes around how you build your products and also how you deliver them to your end users. And at first I thought DevOps was just like deploying, you know, like Heroku, Git push, but it's actually more nuanced than that. In addition to deploying, DevOps is also provisioning or the configuration of your servers to run the necessary software so your application can run. Um, it's also versioning, so controlled releases of your application. You should be able to track each release of your application and roll back to an older version in case something goes wrong. And, and it's complicated because since it encompasses the processes around how you ship your products and build your products, that's going to differentiate from person to person, company to company. So from continuous integration to code reviews, there's so many different like, processes that can fall under DevOps, so it's really hard to give in a concrete definition. But one integral part of DevOps is automation is key. And what automation is, is the, um, normally you have manual tasks that you do in order to deploy an application, but with automation you can translate those tasks to code. And normally you can do that with like IT automation software like Chef or Puppet or Ansible. But the importance of automation is that since you can see what your code is actually going to do, it leaves less room for human error unless you mess like up the code. But you can test that, so that's nice. Um, so what do Ember.js and DevOps really have to do with one another? So a little bit of history before. Um, like back in the day before Ember CLI, you had to just build your Ember application um, just the old way, put it into your JavaScript file and hope that everything was okay. But after Ember CLI was built, Ember CLI Deploy came along and it really revolutionized how you could build your Ember applications. Um, rather than just manually deploying it and SCPing files onto a remote server, you could just type in Ember Deploy Production and you're good to go. And like most Ember plugins, it uses an adapter pla um, pattern. And I originally started delving into DevOps with the Ember applications because I wanted to build an Ember CLI deploy plugin to deploy fast-booted Ember applications to um, DigitalOcean droplets. And fastboot is the um, library that allows you to server render your Ember applications for that SEO juice. So let's talk about the internals of an Ember CLI deploy plugin. So a number CLI deploy plugin can implement up to 11 hooks. Here are the 11 hooks that you can implement with it. It's actually missing one, and it's did deploy, which is activated at the very end. So technically, Ember CLI deploy doesn't only just deploy. It can provision in, in a creative way if you did it in the configure step. It can also build your application before you deploy it. And of course, you can deploy it. Through the activation flag, you can manage your releases. And so I really don't really like the name Ember CLI Deploy. I kind of told Luke, like, hey, you should probably name it Ember CLI DevOps, but that didn't really go over so hot. <laughs> but yeah, now that we have an intro, I'm going to talk about my experience actually building a plugin. Um, 
So the first step for creating an um, Ember CLI deploy plugin is you have to create the Ember add-on and then install the Ember CLI deploy base plugin. So with Ember CLI, you can run this command, Ember add-on, Ember CLI deploy digital ocean, and that will generate your folder for you. And then you can CD into that um, newly created project. Then you can npm install the Ember CLI deploy base plugin. The beauty of this base plugin is, um, like those hooks I mentioned earlier, you would have to like re-implement them from hand if you wanted to build a plugin. But actually, through installing this base plugin, all you have to do is extend it, and you get um, access to all those hooks. So it cuts down on boilerplate. The next step was actually manually deploying the application and taking note of every single step. And I'm really serious whenever I say every single step. Um, so let's actually run through what these steps were to get a fast food application running on a droplet. So yeah, first step, create a droplet. Next, you want to SSH into the droplet. Whenever you, um, while SSH into the droplet, you want to install the relevant software that you needed, so Nginx um, node and NPM and then Ember Fast Boot Server. On your local machine, in your Ember application, you want to build the application and install its dependencies. And then you need to SCP the built Ember application onto the droplet. Then you gotta go back into the machine, go to the upload app, and run the fast boot application. And then you have to update Nginx to proxy over fast boot support and serve up the static assets as a fallback. Then you want to reload Nginx, and then you're done. And then next step was to automate this entire process and translate, so just translate the code. And I saw, I had that realization, and I was just sitting at my computer like. <laughs> so when it comes to automation, I kind of like to break it down into either like problems and then solve those problems one by one, so a series of tasks. So the first problem was, how do I create a droplet for the user? Um, you can, like using DigitalOcean's API, you actually can programmatically create a droplet and I created an Ember command that allowed you to create a droplet with the relevant software or even go into an already created droplet um, to install the relevant software dependencies and all that. So in order to do this, you need to create an access token from the cloud control panel, export it to an environment variable, then you can run the command Ember DO provision, which shows you, which walks you through its wizard about what you want to do. And the first step actually is just create a new droplet or at least ones that already exist. Um, environment would be like actually the deploy target that you wanted to do. And yeah, all the other stages are like um, things that you'll see in the actual control panel online. And I guess like this should be a disclaimer. I actually started building this before I started working at DO, so this is not like some viral marketing type gig, but yeah. And then the next problem was, um, what, I guess like the last command was kind of a misnomer in the sense that it didn't install any of the software dependencies with it. So we actually need to provision the software, the server properly. Um, on my team, we actually used Chef for provisioning. Um, so we just like designate like the cookbooks and the recipes of tasks to run. So you have um, a primary server that um, has all the configuration, and once that changes, it alerts all of the secondary servers connected to it, like, hey, I, ch I changed, so rerun your th um, task again, or whenever it's deployed. So yeah, it's nice to have that with like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and all those other ones, but you really don't have that with Ember, so yeah. Before Fastboot, meaning a regular Ember application that's um, rendered on the client side, you really just had one like software dependency, and that was just like a web server like Nginx or Apache to serve up your static assets. But now with Fastboot, you have more dependencies. It's not only Nginx, we now need Node, NPM, and also like the Fastboot application itself. And another solution that I figured out from like just stuff that we had internally was our one-click install images. Um, I, was I was able to use like the node image to help install the node and NPM dependencies. 
And then for like actually installing other software, you can just SSH into the um, droplet and execute commands to install the rest of the dependencies. So yeah, like I was mentioning, you had a one-click install app of, um, the Node, for Node.js. Um, and you can actually access all of these one-click install images from the API. So I just figured out what the idea of it was and used it in the um, provision command from earlier. And then inside the um, SSH configuration um, for my, inside my code, um, whenever you do create a droplet, you can designate SSH keys. So with that, you need to set the environment variable saying, like, hey, here's where my private key is stored, and also here's the passphrase in order to get into it. And this is some Frankenstein code, because I haven't refactored it yet. But yeah, this will, this will incur in like the will upload hook. Um, before we even think about uploading the app, we can just connect the server, update the dependencies, and also, um, or install relevant dependencies. It's kind of janky, but it works. I'll actually talk more about how this could be improved later. And so like with the provisioning finished, now we need to figure out how do I actually build my Ember application and get it onto the droplet. And the beauty of Ember CLI Deploy is that you don't really have to reinvent the wheel for certain functionality because of like the plugin system. So you can use Ember CLI Deploy Build to actually build the application. Then you can NPM install the dependencies locally and SCP all the files onto the droplet. And yeah, it just handles all the building for you so I don't have to really worry about um, running that command to build the application. And here's an SCP client for to actually upload the um, disk directory of a built Ember application. And before we upload the files, we will need to install the NPM dependencies locally for Fastboot. Um, Fastboot's actually changed a lot, so this step may not be necessary anymore, but I'm still trying to like catch up and um, update my application or plugin for it. And then we will actually upload the built files onto the server, and it will upload it to an Ember app directory on the remote server. Um, and remember how I mentioned Ember CLI deploy build earlier? Um, this variable context.dister um, gives any add-on access to the files that were built by the Ember CLI deploy build plugin. So like, that's why it leaves us one less thing to do. And you can actually use this to um, pull in other plugins, like there's some that um, automatically tags your releases for you, and like, as you build an application, it'll give it a new tag, and you can just use that to your advantage. So it's nice being able to piggyback off of the um, community in order to give back and contribute. And then another prominent yet valid fear whenever you're shipping um, any application, production application, what if like your server restarts or um, something goes wrong? Like how do I make sure that the, app, the Fastboot application will stay up and running? So in order to keep the server running, you can use um, Ubuntu's upstart NIST system to configure applications on the server. I really had no idea that Linux system administration stuff was so difficult. I like was actually reading our tutorials to figure out most of the stuff. But this, like, through creating this um, upstart service, essentially what this file is saying is like, hey, whenever the server has started and the file system is ready, you should try and install Ember Fastboot Server if it isn't already installed. And then you should run the Fastboot Server um, application and make sure it's up and running. And if the user, if the server stops or the user explicitly says server stop fastboot, then you should um, exit out of the application. And it's graceful, so like in case anything happens, it'll always be up and running. And then using that of like SCP, um, SCP client again, I just over, I just added it to the uh, init folder, and that put, that'll automatically put that service in the server's event system. And then the last problem to solve is how do you make sure that the application is up and the user can see it? And when, like, just like the upstart stuff that we just did, one can actually create a custom Nginx template to upload to the server and in place of the default Nginx, Nginx configuration. 
And this is like a snippet of the Nginx config for the Ember application. And then similar to the upstart service, we just directly upload it to the droplet as an nginx.conf file. And then after everything is said and done, we can restart, or actually in this case, probably reload the nginx config. And theoretically, this step may not be necessary so long um, anymore, but I just did it as a safeguard. And we're finally done automating. Yeah, so <laughs> that's me. I'm seeing a lot of blank stares. So I feel like a lot of you are like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> so yeah, there's one small NPM trick that made building deploy plug like this deploy plugin way easier. And it was hidden in the documentation. But it's like NPM link. So before I was like, man, how do I actually test this in like my like um application? I thought I'd have to like publish it to NPM every single time I wanted to test something. But with this, you can actually use npm link in order to, um, you can use npm link on the plugin directory from any Ember project. And you can, what it will do is it will install the, um, it will install the like, package from your local file system into your um, other project. But you don't really have to keep on installing it every single time you make a change. It keeps up with the changes in real time. So it's pretty nice to be able to see like, the changes I'm making immediately. And it's really simple, like, you can like run it this way just by like, you know, do an npm link, the project name, and then relink it in another directory. Or shorthand, just go to the project you want, and then using npm link to the absolute file path of the JavaScript package, you can also do that as well to save time. And yeah, so we went from being a room of flames to like, figuring out the slit. So it saved me so much time on testing the add-on. It's pretty clutch, like, not gonna lie. So yeah, you can check out the repo here. It's where the source code's at. Um, try and do some more work on it right now and improve upon it. And like, while the plugin's dope, it kind of it, it does have its short the shortcomings. For one, there's really no way to deploy to multiple servers at the moment. Um, like I said earlier, with like Chef, you can just have one primary server and then the secondary servers communicate with that. Um, primary one, but you know, JavaScript right now, so not really having that right now. And I think the importance of having multiple servers is mostly from like, you know, a load balancing perspective, so that would be kind of crucial, but it may not be as big of a deal breaker for some um, individuals or small projects. And the way the plugin's coded right now, there are provisioning tasks that, are, that get rerun unnecessarily. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is actually move that provisioning like installation step of like Nginx and everything else from within the actual plugin into the provision command. So after the droplet is success successfully created, it should just SSH um, and automatically install the dependencies that it needs and it should be good to go. And also there's no means of controlling um, like, there's no controlled release management. Um, in order to activate a new version of the application, they theoretically would have to go back, like, get check out an old version and then redeploy. Um, but I kind of have an idea of how I'm going to solve this because what you can do with Fastboot App Server, which is a production server that's ready for Fastboot, is create watchers that alerts the server whenever a new version is created. So using symlinks on the base directory, and concatenating like each version onto the end. You just have to switch up the directory for the server, and once those files change, it'll restart. Um, so yeah, that's cool. And, but yeah, I can't do that until I get rid of the old fast boot serving logic. So um, like I said, it's hard kind of keeping up with the community and how things move really fast in Webland, and even in the last like one year. But like, so yeah, um, hopefully you're going to get to use Fastboot App Server in place of um, the old Fastboot um, logic, serving logic. So, yeah. And I definitely have ideas for future enhancements. Like I mentioned earlier, zero downtime deploys would be pretty nice. Um, and I think it's once uh, I migrate to Fastboot App Server, since it's running a cluster, it like spins up 16 processes or something like that and restarts um, one, um, one process at a time it should have zero downtime deploys if I can get that strategy like ironed out.
get it more closely and get it working. And SSL support, you know, I feel like it'd be dope if there was automated support for SSL or um, TLS with Let's Encrypt and just automatic renewal of the certificate because it would be nice just to be able to ship your application. It's like, oh, hey, sorry, got like SSL set up for me because nobody really wants to set that up every single time. And you know, today, before today, I never really knew how to define semantic versioning. I just saw it a lot on the internet. I was like, yeah, cool, get, it makes sense, you know? But um, really, it's important to have a semantically versioned um, library, especially when it comes to something like as business critical as deploying, because you don't want to like, have a breaking change like, unexpectedly. So it'd be good to break you up into major and minor releases to make sure like, every, nothing breaks and that everything's um, all fine and dandy, because I really don't want to be held liable for losing somebody money. And yeah, I guess the question stands, what exactly is the future of DevOps? There's a lot of talk about Docker and Docker containers, and like, you know, they're lightweight, and they really allow for a rapid deployment of like, applications, and even mirroring like, your production environment mad closely to your development environment. And I'm, like, what's the future of Docker and Ember together? Um, I'm kind of like, I'm trying to explore how we could containerize a number of fast food application to, or how the two play together. And I'm actually like, I'm wondering, is that really even possible? And I have no idea. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just a couple of thanks. Tom, Dale, he's helped me a lot, a lot with like thinking through the logic of what I'm doing and just all his fast food work. Luke Melia, he's the guy that created Ember CLI Deploy. Um, he answered a lot of my questions I had around the Deploy plugin and like contributing. So I really appreciate him. David Pett, Sonara Ember developer. He was one of, the, um, one of the few individuals that tested out the application or the plugin on a side project and gave me real time feedback. And of course, DigitalOcean for like flying me out here and letting me be here and speak and everybody else. So yeah. Thanks.